Okay, we're discussing our papers about would you enjoy a conversation with Socrates. I genuinely believe that Socrates was sincere in his desire to find the truth. And Plato, we have to remember something. Plato is writing a literary work when we read these, okay? He's not necessarily, okay, first of all, I, I know he is not, he did not take notes on these conversations that Socrates had, all right, and reconstruct these. He may have been present for some of them and he may have used some of the things that Socrates said, but he's also, you know, making a literary work in and of itself. And so he's got a point to the entire dialogue that, that makes it seem like Socrates is railroading it towards a certain goal, because Plato is railroading it towards a certain goal, right? But, um, and, and also, Plato obviously loved his teacher, and he, and he wants him to look good, and I don't think he would intentionally paint a portrait of somebody who was just kind of a jerk and, and, and contradicted people all the time. I think that if we could ever get to the historical Socrates, all right, under, underneath the Plato's and um, some of you mentioned Xenophon, who was also another Greek writer that wrote dialogues involving Socrates, um, that he would not come across <laughs> like a jerk, um, for lack of a better phrase, you know, that he, as someone who genuinely wanted to know the truth and someone who, if he met someone on the street and was confronted by a contradiction in his own argument, would be persuaded by that. I, I choose to believe that Socrates, in, in, you know, could have been, would have been persuaded to alter his viewpoint if he had met someone that seemed to know more than he did. Because I, I think he genuinely wanted to find the truth and not his truth, you know, I'm razzing Kyle a little bit, but but we all, and I know Kyle doesn't believe his truth is, is his truth, I know what he meant. Um, so, but, but some of you did say uh, that the distinction was made several times, the difference between would a conversation with Socrates be enjoyable versus beneficial? Enjoyable didn't win real well, but beneficial came out with more points, so you did. You enjoyed, it. and you were going to say something else. Go ahead. Um, so I mean, you said that the Nicomachean ethics Yeah. I'm so sorry, but like that was sorry. One of the easiest readings. Okay. In person. So it's you know what? Erotics. This is was the consensus yesterday too. I am blown away. I am because so simple, right? I was thinking, oh, those poor children, what have I done? And, and they came in yesterday and said the exact same thing. Uh, and I said, you know, I said, Aristotle, I know it's really dense. It's really tight. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this to you guys. I think I did that as far as we know, this may be lecture notes. This may not, and, and, and I said, you know, you have Plato and it's da da da, you know, and, and <laughs> that's my impression. My impression is, da, da, da. Um, but it's, you know, there's responses and, and don't you think this is correct? And, and I like Plato's little, see, I like Herodotus though too. I like the little, oh, let's go on a happy little journey on the side path. And then I don't mind if I have to go back and say, what are we talking about? And, and, and then Aristotle's just boom, boom, boom. It's just thing after thing after thing. And there's no, no break, no place to catch a breath. And I just, it strikes me as, um, you know, just so complicated. So when I was rereading this last summer, I was writing these questions for the document. I'm like, oh, what am I doing to these children? I know they're gonna kill me. They're gonna lynch me after I leave class. It's gonna be awful. And I'm so relieved, but some of them said the same thing. I like the density of Aristotle. I like boom, 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 boom. I don't want, yeah, I'm so relieved. It's just no. He doesn't. He does do. He he does do what anybody who's making an art, building an argument, has to do sometimes, which is go back and say, now we're going to have to look at this. You know, if we're going to decide if virtue is an activity of the soul, well, now we have to figure what virtue is. But he just says that. He says, now we're going to do this, but I feel like 
maybe Plato doesn't do that for us. You just have to kind of pick up, okay, why are we talking about this now? And um, I am pleased and relieved. Um, let me show you our Art of the Week uh, quickly. This is a, a Rembrandt uh, and a, a Dutch painter of the 17th century. And its title is Aristotle Contemplating a Bust of Homer. This is all I have to say about this painting. We do not know, obviously Aristotle is in sort of Renaissance garb with his gold change and his, his puffy sleeves. Um, think of puffy sleeves as being a Renaissance thing. Uh, and, and, and he's got a look, he's, he's bearded. Some people still argue that this isn't Aristotle, it's supposed to be someone else. Like this isn't a done deal description. And, and Rembrandt is dead and we can't call him up and say what's the story with this painting. Um, but he's got this look, and the thing that puzzles people is, what is he thinking? Is he, it looks, to me it looks loving, it looks kind, like he's thinking of Homer, he, he, and is he thinking, Homer, even though I am brilliant and have this philosophical system and was the tutor to the conqueror of the world, you reach people's souls through your poetry in a way that my logic never will. Hats off to you. Or is he saying, Homer, you were good in your day. You gave us what you had, but I have superseded you. I am bringing light into souls with my teaching that you never brought in with your philosophy. It can be whichever you want, I guess. It can be your truth, because there is no, we, we just, well, it would be, thank you. Yeah, it would be your opinion, this is, this is so. I, I, I'm going to go with that too. Um, so, at any rate, this great Dutch master apparently decided Aristotle and Homer were worthy of being in one of his paintings, and that says something to the longevity of what we're reading this year. You know, that 2,500 years later, we're sitting here reading this stuff. Okay, I wasn't actually going to have you read the whole book because of time, and also because the, the chapter on justice, frankly, is just mm, mm. But here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I've decided. Since this uh, response has been thumbs up on Aristotle, here's what we're going to do. You guys are going to miss the last class. The last class involves reading Plutarch's Life of Alexander the Great and me basically talking about it and talking about what happens next. How, how does the Greek world fall apart? That will be available to you on my YouTube channel, okay? That will be the class we don't get. And so if, if everybody's just like, yay, raw, let's do Aristotle. We were gonna spend, we'll spend the rest of this year reading this book, two, two books a week. So we're going to read, we're going to read three and four next week, and then the last week we were going to read book eight, which is all about friendship. And then book ten, which is, I don't remember what the theme of book ten is, part of book ten. All right, but here's what you can do. If anybody wants to read the whole book, the ethics, go for it. And you know what? Like, you can call me on the phone and chat about it if you want to. I'm good with that, okay? But because of time constraints, that's, that's where we are, okay? But that's what I'm going to do. We're going to spend the rest of the year in the ethics, and if you choose to read The Life of Alexander, or even if you choose not to, you could flip on the YouTube video and just watch me chat about Alexander the Great and finish off your school year. Okay, let's, let's dig into this. And um, some of you, a couple of you gave me your papers. Any questions on this sort of challenging paper, but I feel like we've talked about a lot of material that both is, uh, you know, uh, compatible with Christianity and also just not compatible at all. So hopefully you have enough. Yes, Carson. Oh, okay. So, so just what, are Christians, can Christians approve? Okay. Parents and crafting stuff. Oh, okay. All right. So if, if there's no questions, I, since you guys gave me, I forgot to tell you the new elocution element. We're just going to skip it. It was going to be assonance. 
Did we talk? Okay. Okay, assonance. Okay, you can add this to your book if you want to. Okay, this will be optional. So don't, if you gave me your paper, kudos to you, don't worry about it. But assonance, if you want to add it to the, your elocution elements at the end. Assonance is the repetition of an internal vowel sound. Yes, except it's inside the word, it's internal. Um, so vowel sound does it. Ow, ow. Vowel sound. It's internal because it's in the middle of the word. It's not beginning. And it, it, and you do it at least three times. So, uh, and it doesn't matter how it's spelled, just like alliteration. So, for example, thought, caught, pot, father. They all would have assonance with each other, even though we have O-U-G-H, A-U-G-H, O, and A, because they all sound like ah in the middle of a word. Oh, yeah, do it, do it. If you, yeah, that'd be awesome. I don't know if you should label it ass. <laughs> I feel like maybe we should get another abbreviation. <laughs> I just, because A-L-L was alliteration, I'm like, I'm going to have a bunch of papers with the word ass written all over them. <laughs> A-S-S-O, okay, or just A-S. Oh, yeah. That would be just ass. Yeah, and they'll say, as what, as what, because I won't remember what we were doing. Um, so that was our, our final one this year. It is another one that appeals to the ear, not to the eye, and not to the reason, like similes and antithesis make us think about things in new ways. Assonance and alliteration just sound pretty. And you know what? Pretty is good. I just, the littler kids are reading The Hobbit, and I just read to them about the goblins when they go through the mountains and they get kidnapped by the goblins. The goblins make no beautiful things, but they make many clever ones. It says in The Hobbit. They make no beautiful things, but many clever ones. Don't be a goblin. Love beautiful things. Yes. Yes. Do not become a goblin. Okay, let's read this book. I'm going to read. I I'm going to read sections of it to you, because I just expected y'all to come. This is Ferguson. We don't know what's going on. I don't, why did I think this of you? I don't know. And by the way, I don't make you make that mocking voice in my head when I think of all of you. Um, let's start at the beginning, because. to break into do re mi. <laughs> start at the very beginning. Very good place to start. Um, uh, no, because the way an author chooses to begin a book tells you something about the nature of the book and also about what to expect. So at the very beginning, I love that the title of the first book is The Object of Life. Well, that's a big, that's a big book one, The Object of Life. <laughs> like, what? He says every, so I'm just going to begin at this first page, okay? I'm just going to read this section. Every art and every investigation, I'm just reading the beginning, and similarly every action and pursuit is considered to aim at some good. Hence, the good has been rightly defined as that at which all things aim. Clearly, however, there is some difference between the ends at which they aim. Some are activities and others results distinct from activities. Sometimes we do things and the point of doing it is just to do it. What is the point, what is the end of riding a roller coaster? Yeah, just being, just pleasure. If you, if you find that sort of thing pleasurable. <laughs> yeah, which can be pleasurable. A little bit of fear can bring pleasure. But some things we do to get to do something else, right? Um, the end of making a dress is not making a dress. The end of making a dress is to wear it and go out and look nice and say, I made this, you know? All right, what? Or it's also the end of baking. Now, baking may have a dual purpose. 
there is pleasure in the process. But you probably don't say, I'm going to bake these purely for the pleasure. Maybe you do. But often you also want to eat, you want to eat the product, right? Or you want to give away the product or, or you know, make someone else happy with the product. So, yes, which we are not doing when we eat cookies. Okay, you, you waited. What did you want to say, Carson? Uh, I'm sorry. Did I make you wait so long? It wasn't important anymore. Um, so he, this is what Aristotle's saying. Some things are the activities and some are the results. Where there are ends distinct from the actions, the results are by nature superior to the activities. It is better to wear the dress than to make the dress because the point of making the dress is wearing the dress. Anything you do for another goal, the goal is better than the process because that's the point of it. Exactly. Since there are many actions, arts and sciences, it follows that their ends are many too. The end of medical science is health, of military science, victory, of economic science, wealth. In the case of all skills of this kind, they come under a single faculty, a single category. As a skill in making bridles, or any part of a horse's trappings, comes under horsemanship. While this, and every other kind of military action, comes under military science. You see the progression there? I make bridles for the horse, but I'm using the horse for a military action. So technically, all of this comes under military science even making horseshoes. If I'm using the horse for something else, then the making of the bridle comes under the horsemanship, but the horsemanship comes under plowing. Yes, whatever you're gonna use the horse for. So in the same way, other skills are subordinate to yet others. In all these, the ends of the directive arts are to be preferred in every case to those of the subordinate ones because it's for the sake of the former that the latter are pursued also. It makes no difference whether the ends of the actions are the activities themselves or something apart from them, as in the case of the sciences we have just mentioned. If then, our activities have some end which we want for its own sake and for the sake of which we want all other ends, if we do not choose everything for the sake of something else, for this will involve an infinite progression so that our aim will be pointless and ineffectual. It is clear that this must be the good that is the supreme good. You can't just always do something for the sake of something else, and that for the sake of something else, and that for the sake of something else. It's gotta be, the train has to get to the station someday. There's gotta, there's gotta be an end. And Aristotle says, whatever that thing is, the thing that everything else we do in life, it's for that. That must be the good. Does it not follow then that a knowledge of the good is of great importance to us for the conduct of our lives? Are we not more likely to achieve our aim if we have a target? If this is so, we must try to describe at least and outline what the good really is and by which of the sciences or faculties it is studied. What is that thing? that we do everything else for. Now, what? Yes, and that, this is, you're not the first student this week to mention that. Unfortunately, this is not an option for Aristotle, is it? Right? This is the best things in life. This is his other one. This is where he goes to a college campus. So some of you are familiar with this from last year um, when we read The Unaborted Socrates, this series of books where Socrates comes back um, to the modern world uh, he is resurrected or is somehow present, uh, it's not clear. And then he has his dialogues with people uh, to find out why they're doing what they're doing. So in the Unaborted Socrates, which the junior high class read last year, uh, he goes to Athens and he talks to an abortion doctor about abortion, what is abortion? Um, and how is it possibly not murder? So in this one, he goes to a college campus, Desperate State University. and. And he asks students why they're doing what they're doing. 
And the first student he meets is a, is a young man named Peter Pragma. Prag being pragmatical means you do what's useful. Pragmatic means useful, and his name's Peter Pragma. He does what's useful. And so he meets Socrates, and I'm going to just read a section of this because he also has a problem with what is the end? What is the end of, of what I'm doing? Okay, so he's studying, and Socrates asks him what he's doing. And uh, so this is going to be Socrates, and this is going to be Peter, okay? Um, although you can pretty much tell which is which by the... Okay. Socrates says, um, answer the question, please. I'm studying to pass my course, of course. And why do you want to do that? Another silly question. Don't you ever grow up? Let me tell you a secret, Peter. There are no grown-ups. But you still haven't answered my silly question. To get a degree, of course. You mean all the time and effort and money you put into your education here at Desperate State is to purchase that little piece of paper? That's the way it is. I think you may be able to guess what my next question is. I'm catching on. I think it's an infection. What is the next question, then? You're going to ask me why I want a degree. And you're going to answer. But it's another silly question. Everyone knows what a degree is for. But I am not everyone. So would you please tell me? <clears throat> a college degree is the entrance ticket to a good job. Do you know how difficult the job market is today? Where have you been for the last few years? You, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. But we must ask just one more question, or rather two. What is a good job, and why do you want one? Money, of course. That's the answer to both questions. To all questions, maybe. I see. And what do you want to do with all the money you make? You said your last two questions were your last. If you want to go away, I cannot keep you here. But if we pursue our explorations one little step further, we may discover something new. What do you think you'll find? A new world? Quite possibly, a new world of thought. Will you come with me? Shall we trudge ahead through the swamps of our uncertainties? Or shall we sit comfortably at home in our little cave? Why should I torture myself with all these silly questions from a strange little man? I'm supposed to be studying for my exam. Because it would be profitable for you. The unexamined life is not worth living, you know. I heard that somewhere. Good grief, that's one of the quotations that might be on my exam tomorrow. Who said that anyway? I did. Didn't you hear me? No, I mean, who said it originally? It was I, I assure you. Now, shall we continue our journey? What are you getting at anyway, Socrates? No, Peter, the question is, what are you getting at? That is the topic we were exploring. Now, shall we continue to make your life a little less unexamined and a little more worth living? All right, for a little while anyway. Then will you answer my last question? Forgot what it was. What do you need money for? Everything, everything I want costs money. For instance, do you know how much it costs to raise a family nowadays? And what would you say is the largest expense in raising a family nowadays? Probably sending the kids to college. I see. Let's review what you have said. You are reading this book to study for your exam so you can pass it and your course to graduate and get a degree, to get a good job, to make a lot of money, to raise a family and send your children to college. Right. And why will they go to college? Same reason I'm here. Get good jobs, of course. So they can send their children to college? Yes. Have you ever heard of the expression arguing in a circle? No, I never took logic. Really? I would never have guessed it. All right, so that's that section. But, so obviously that's a problem, but listen to this section too. What benefit do, to yourself do you hope the money from a well-paying job will bring you? All sorts of things, the good life, fun and games, leisure. I see, and you are now giving up fun and games for some serious studying so that you can pass your exams and your courses and get your degree. Right, it's called delayed gratification. I could be watching the football game right now or playing poker, but I'm putting my time in the bank. You see, it's an investment for the future. When I'm set up in a good job, I'll be able to call my own shots. You mean you will then have leisure and be able to watch football games and play poker whenever you wish? Right. Why don't you just do those things right now? What? Why do you work instead of play if all you want to do is play? You're working now so that years from now you can have enough money to afford leisure to play. But you can play now. So why take the long hard road if you're already home? 
It seems to be another circle back to where you started from, where you are now. Highly recommend. Very fun. I mean, that's another reason we need a higher purpose. Yes. If, if all we do is spend our lives at a job so that we can retire and have leisure, just quit your job and do it now. If that's all it means, if that's all it is. So. Exactly. This is a big gamble. Drop out and play poker. No. <laughs> Find a better reason to work. Um, so this is what Aristotle is saying here. There must be something we choose everything for because if it just goes back around in a circle like that, it's meaningless, it's pointless. So I already, we already answered the first couple of questions, I think. I told you last week what an end is. I kind of warned you about that, that it means a goal and, um, and that there must be a chief good for the reason that we just talked about, that if you choose everything for something else, it would go on to infinity. And it just, this just doesn't make sense. You can't always be choosing to do something for the sake of something else. Eventually you reach the pinnacle. Um, and we also, I warned you a little bit about his, his comment that um, whatever this science is, that's the, the goal to which all things aim, it, it's the science of politics. And, and I warned you to beware of that. It doesn't mean run for office. It means live in a society with other human beings. Because as he says later in the book, man is a social animal. You, you may be introverted. You may, like a little bit of social might go a long way for you. But still, we are made to be with other people. And one of the reasons as this book unfolds is because, let's I'll put it in Christian terms. Love your neighbor as yourself. If I don't have any neighbors or I don't spend my time with other human beings, this is very difficult to do. It's very difficult to exercise virtue in a vacuum all by yourself. Now, I'm going to just put a plug in here because uh, often, you know, people in monasteries get a bad rap. Well, they're not doing anything for people. They're praying for us. They're, they're praying for the world. Praying is doing a thing. You, you can be alone and pray. If you're, if I'm, you know, decrepit in a nursing home someday and all by myself and I can't do anything and I can't read, I still pray. No one has to have a, a useless life in relationship to other people. But in general, most of us aren't going to live that way, right? We're going to be around other people and when we rub shoulders with other people who may or may not be annoying and make us practice patience and kindness and all you know, the, the fruits of the spirit, we need other people, and, and we just know that people tend to gravitate together, right? People tend to, you know, like I'm thinking of Little House on the Prairie, and I'm thinking of Pa moving them out there into Kansas, you know? But their neighbors may be miles, a couple miles away, but they know them, and they get together and, you know, um, bring stew when you're sick or whatever. We, this is what we do for each other. So that's why he says we're political. Remember, political comes from polites, which means citizen. And they're citizens of what? The polis, the city-state. Which, you know, for these Greeks was the be-all and end-all of civilization. The self-sufficient city-state. An Athens, or a Sparta, or a Corinth, or a Thebes. And we are made to be a part of that. Now, you, you may dispute that. You may not like that link in Aristotle's thinking. But, but most of us do understand that we, we, just, we, are, we are social creatures, either little or much. So he says, because of that, because that seems to be flow out of our nature, whatever this supreme good is must have something to do with our political life, our life together as citizens of the Quad Cities, of Illinois or Iowa, of the United States, that somehow it's bound up with that. All right. I'm going to... See, I had this wonderful like presentation and all my stuff underlined in red, and then it's like I'm going to have to skip some. Um, oh, let me ask you this one. So why does he think that young men are not... shouldn't be studying politics? Okay. Because... 
experience and practice makes you better. It just does. And, and you know what? We, we have age, minimum age requirements for our legislators and president. We also feel like until you have a little bit of experience of life and the world of other people, you're not qualified to rule other people. How about average high school students at all? But 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 yes, but there are anomalies, and so I mean we can't be like Socrates Republic, and we can't you know start breeding people and then watching them closely to see who responds well and putting temptations in their path on purpose to see how they respond. But, um, you know, the first thing that popped in my head, Ethan, is uh, Timothy. Um, when Paul tells Timothy in the Bible, don't let anyone despise you because of your youth. Um, that Timothy had been brought up on the scriptures from youth by his mother and grandmother, and he had a certain level, apparently, of wisdom and capability not uh, corresponding to his, his age. He, he maybe was an anomaly, and Paul entrusted a lot to Timothy, um, even though he was, he was a young man, we don't know how old, but you know, a relatively young man. Um, but in general, uh, in general, young people do not have the experience of life that some, that is the only way to learn some things, uh, unfortunately, just because we're slow learners as human beings, and also because some things never occur to you until they happen. And then you've got to figure out how to deal with it. And then working through that, you, you have wisdom on the other side. You know, I'm thinking of um, in Aeschylus' play um, in, the, in the first one, uh, in Agamemnon, they say, we must suffer unto truth. And that is a stunning line to me. We must suffer unto truth. We do. Yeah, Carson. Ward. Shall remain nameless. And, okay, I, I was going to say something. Uh, I should, oh, okay, I, I might as well. You know, it's like we're not counting dementia, all right? <laughs> dementia. We forgive people for dementia. We just shouldn't elect them. Okay, so. <clears throat> <laughs> so I'm done with politics for the day. Um, so, so Aristotle says, uh, this is page six. Uh, to resume, since all knowledge and every pursuit aim at some good, what, we, what do we take to be the end of political science? Because he just said that's the, he didn't say political science is an end, it's, it's the science which directs towards the end. What is the end? He says, well, so far as the name goes, there is pretty general agreement. It is happiness, say both ordinary and cultured people. But they identify happiness with living well or doing well. Now, this is when I need to, to stop us just a moment because happy doesn't mean the same thing for us. And maybe you'll be relieved to find that out because you might find this to have been shallower than you wanted it to be if you think of happy as, oh, I love Whitey's ice cream, I'm so happy, you know, like no. So in the introduction, um, I made a note to myself to go back and read this to you. There's a, there's a there were, it's, it's eudaimonia. It, daimon is what we get demon from, it's that tutelary spirit, okay? But eudaimonia is, an, uh, is the idea of being sort of blessed, blessed by the gods. And the, the guy who wrote the introduction says, the notion of eudaimonia is closely tied in a way in which the notion of happiness is not to success. The eudaimon is someone who makes a success of his life and his actions, who realizes his aims and ambitions as a man, 
who fulfills himself. I don't mean success in material terms. I mean, you're living a successful life with other people, oh, spiritually. And it says, the ethics we are thus supposing is not telling us how to be morally good men or even how to be humanly happy. It is telling us how to live successful human lives, how to fulfill ourselves as men and women. Men means mankind there. So, so this is what happiness is. And that's why he said people associate with doing well or living well. Doing good things and living well. Not in a rich way, not in a luxurious way, but well. I am in a good relationship with those around me, you know, because I know how to comport myself around them and to, to maintain that relationship. And that's a really different, because happy to us is just, oh, I'm happy, you know, and maybe I won't be really, half an hour from now. Which really tells something about the way I Yes. But we're not, so we're not, Aristotle is not recommending happiness in the modern American 2022 way. He's, he's, he's recommending um, living lives of fulfillment to be what we were created to be. Yes. Eudaimonia. Aristotle would argue, and he's going to argue, that a person who lives this sort of life will indeed be happy in the sense that we mean it. That we will have felicity, joy, good feelings. And it's sort of like the good, um, you know, when you go take food to the food pantry or you go do a service project or something, and it makes you happy. And I, I mean, you take pleasure in the fact that you're helping others, but it, honest to goodness, makes you happy. Like you leave and you see that the person you helped is, is thank you, I don't know how I could have done this, or thank you, this is, food on my table, or whatever you've done, it genuinely gives you a happy feeling. Not just, do, do you know what I mean? And, and it's a very fulfilling, and it's good that we have that, because it, it, God gives us extra ammo, do you know what I mean, in ourselves to, to do these things. He, he doesn't have to reward us with a feeling of happiness when we serve other people, but he gives it to us. And it's an encouragement to go out and do it again. Yeah. Including the happiness. So something that it makes me think of. So um, Jesus, uh, somewhat disturbingly said, among many other disturbing things he said, be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect, which <clears throat> is like, mm, OK. Well, I know we're supposed to shoot for a certain, you know, perfection, and great, I'm doing that, and God will help me, but I'm never going to be perfect in this life, and, you know, and I don't know what Jesus, you know, apparently he understands I'm not perfect, but he tells me to be perfect, what's up with that? But the word for perfect in the Greek means complete. Be complete. Be everything you were created to be. Just as the Father is in himself, everything, he is sufficient under himself. He is everything, not that he was created to be because he wasn't created, but you know what I mean. He, he has everything that God should have. I don't even know what that means. And likewise, we were created to be a certain thing. Be it. Be fulfilled as a human being. Obviously, we can't do that without him. St. Augustine famously said, um, you know, our hearts are restless and they will not rest until they find rest in me. And some people say, you know, there's a God-shaped hole in your heart or, you know, however they want to say it. Um, it's not as poetic way. I'm not, I'm not as fond of that as Augustine. But it's, they're saying the same thing. There's something inside us that has to be, to fulfill our mission as human creatures. We must have God. 
with, without without him we cannot do that and and we must serve him we must put ourselves at his service and that fulfills our calling as being a human being but of course your calling as a human being is going to be different than mine but the specifics are going to differ which takes us back to Aristotle because he also knows that we're going to differ um, in our specifics. Um, so he decides that it's happiness. The end of everything is happiness, but a deep-seated, joyful happiness, okay? Not a very transitory, I got a new toy or I got a new pair of shoes and it makes me happy for like two hours and then now they're not new anymore. Not that sort of happiness. Um, so I'm going to skip up. I'm going to skip a few things. Um, and I feel, thank you so much, I feel better about doing that because everybody seems to be on board with Aristotle and being able to follow him. Um, so he says on page 10, <clears throat> so this happiness, this fulfillment of this life is apparently the good because whatever we aim at, whatever we do everything else for must be the good. And if that's happiness in living out our lives in this way, then let's talk about the good. But he says this very cutely. Perhaps we had better examine the universal. He means the form. And consider critically what is meant by it. Although such a course is awkward because the forms were introduced by friends of ours. Shoot, I am now gonna diss the forms. So sorry, Plato. Love ya, but. Um, yet surely it would be thought better or rather necessary, above all for philosophers, to refute in defense of the truth even views to which one is attached. And although both are dear, it is right to give preference to the truth. If Plato is wrong, my dear teacher Plato, I'm going to have to tell Plato he is wrong. So he says in this chapter, uh, sort of the, the beginning of that uh, by the 25, Again, things are called good in as many senses as they are said to exist. Like, good pizza and a good dog are not the same good. Please. You can't train a pizza. Don't eat your dog. Don't, don't. And, and a good person is different from both of these. And saying God is good, is different from all of those. You know, a good day means any number of things. And so thinking of The Hobbit again. Um, so if you've seen the movie, if you've read the book, but since my little kids are reading The Hobbit, you know, when Gandalf comes at the beginning and, you know, Bilbo says good day to him, but later he says good day, and he says, well, a lot of things you use good day for, you know. Now it means you want to get rid of me. You, you, don't, you don't want me around anymore. You're tired of this conversation. So if that is true, how can Plato's form of the good exist if there are all different kinds of good? Like, does a good pizza partake of the form of the good, just like a good dog? Or are there two different forms of the good, one related to taste pleasure and one related to obedience? Or you can't even say pleasantness. I mean, I suppose a good human being is pleasant to be around, but that's not what we mean by saying they're a good human being. We don't mean they're pleasant to be around. We mean they're morally good. They're virtuous. And so Aristotle's like, parent Plato, I don't think so. I don't think we can contemplate a universal good. He even goes on to say on page 13, top of page 13, <clears throat> there is another problem. What advantage in his art will a weaver or a joiner get from his knowledge of the good itself? How will one who has had a vision of the idea itself there become thereby a better doctor or general? As a matter of fact, it does not appear that the doctor even studies health in this way. His concern is the health of a human being or perhaps rather of a particular patient because what he treats is the individual. So much for our discussion of this topic. Remember the School of Athens painting where Aristotle has hand 
particular. Doctors don't even study the form of health. They study you and you and you and you and over years of experience and talking to other doctors, because there wasn't a med school back then, you know, like we have medical school. But even our doctors get training, you know, internship. Yes, because we want them to be, I've had a lot of experience of this sort of disease or what's wrong with me. We want to go and they say, yes, I recognize this and I know what to do about it. Yes, but they don't spend time contemplating the form of health. That will not help me at all. Yes. Yes. Oh, oh, okay. Right, right. But, but there's a reason. We, in, we entrust our lives to these people, right? And we want them to be trained. But their training involves in particular patients, not I, even particular diseases. And you might say, well, they're learning from a textbook. But what do they do? They take them as soon as possible. And they look at particular human beings. They meet particular human beings. So, so Aristotle's not a big fan of the forms. Doesn't see how this helps us at all. Um, so in the next chapter, he says, well, now let's go back again to the good, which is the object of our search, and ask what it can possibly be. He says, skipping down a bit, it is for the sake of which everything else is done. Skipping down again, if there is any one thing that is the end of all actions, this will be the practical good, or goods if there is more than one, so we need to figure out what that is. And um, he says on the next page by the 1097b, happiness, more than anything else, is thought to be just such an end because we always choose it for itself, never for any other reason. We never say, I want to be happy so that, I just wanna be happy. It's not so that anything else. I, I just want to be happy. Happiness then, and this is his definition, provisional definition on page 20. Happiness then is found to be something perfect and self-sufficient, being the end to which all our actions are directed. But of course he can't leave it there. He has to figure out what is that happiness. And in the next section, and that takes us to the last, uh, that final um, question that I asked you. His, his Definition of the ultimate or final good. He says, page 16, right below the 15. If all this is so, the conclusion is that the good for man is an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. An activity of the soul. So it's doing something. The good for man is an activity in accordance, and it's in your soul, and it's in accordance with virtue. Those three things. With, with the best of all the virtues. All right? So he, he, he says, you know, people, most people agree with this. Most former philosophers would agree with this because, you know, we never praise happiness. We praise courage. But we, he, that, that was a very brave, brave thing you did. We praise that. But nobody says that was really good happiness. The happiness was, was, that was a good one. No, it's always good. It just is good. You don't have to praise it. We don't have to explain why we like it. It's just self-evident. It's like pleasure. And I'm talking about pleasure within reason. You know, we, that, was a, that was a really good pleasure. No, that, it, it wouldn't be pleasure if it wasn't good. The pleasure is the good, and so it says the way with happiness. So, so I'm going to skip over that for time constraints. Um, okay, let's go up to page 24. Um, this, this, you know, he sounds like his teacher a little bit here. Middle of the page by the 35. 
If, as we said, the quality of a life is determined by its activities, no man who is truly happy can become miserable because he will never do things that are hateful and mean. If happiness is in my soul and it is a certain activity of my soul directed towards other people, then I can't ever be miserable because I choose it. Even if bad things happen to me. In that sense, well, we'll become Christians now. The martyrs are not miserable. And Jesus says, do not fear those that can kill the body, but can throw the body and soul together in hell. That's miserable. It's a joy that it can't be taken away from you. So at the bottom of that page, he says, we are now in a position to define the happy man as one who is active in accordance with complete virtue and who is adequately furnished with external goods because he does admit that you can't be completely happy and be completely destitute and starving. There, there's a certain level of material necessities that go towards a good, happy life. They just are. And that not for some unspecified per period, but through the complete life. It, he's not just doing this for a moment. He's doing this through his whole life. Hold on to that idea, because he's going to come back to that again, doing it over a whole life. Okay, so if that's true, then on page 27 he says, we must examine the nature of virtue. Well, if happiness for man, if the goal of living a human life is actively pursuing virtue, it's an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue that wants virtue. Now we have to figure out that. He says this is pretty important because if this is really our goal as human beings, we better know what it is. Like he said at the beginning, you won't hit the target if you don't have a target. You know, interest, interestingly, I might have mentioned this before, the Greek word for sin in the New Testament is harmatia. It means miss the mark, like you're shooting at a target and you miss the mark. When we sin, we miss the mark. And Aristotle says later, I think, I'll, I'll get to it, but I'll say it now. There's lots of ways to be wrong, but there's only one way to be right. You can miss the target there, 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 but there's only one way to hit the bullseye. And that's, um, everything else falls short of the mark. When we sin, we, we fall short as human beings. We fall short of God's expectation of us and what we were created to be, more importantly. Yes? Really? Yes, not in a moral sense, but... That's very interesting, because it's the same word in the New Testament. That's very interesting. Um, so, the, so let's move on to book two, okay? We've got half an hour left. Let's move on to book two. So, so in book one, we've decided that happiness is our goal, but that happiness is an activity of our souls, and it's a virtuous activity of our souls. So now we have to look at what virtue is. And he says here at the beginning of book two, there are two kinds of virtue. What are they? Ethan. Intellectual and moral goodness. So wisdom, cleverness, these are intellectual virtues. And he says, you, you can teach them. You can learn them from other people. Moral virtues, though, are acquired how? I'll mix it up. I said it in the question, but how do we get moral virtues? By habit. By habit. Um, he says, um, the moral virtues, he said, this is the bottom of that first paragraph on, on page 31. The moral virtues then are engendered in us neither by nor contrary to nature, we are constituted by nature to receive them, but their full development in us is due to habit. In this book and in other books, Aristotle talks a lot about the difference between 
potentiality and actuality, all right? An acorn is a potential oak tree, and an oak tree is an actual oak tree, right? And so he's saying, we all have the potential to develop these virtues. Now, always, I hope that it is a given in this class, even, but I don't expressly say it every time, from a Christian perspective, we cannot develop these virtues without grace. All right, please, please know that I am always acknowledging that, but as I'm speaking as Aristotle, sometimes it might come across that I'm not fully hitting that. I feel like we're all on the same page here and we know that I'm not recommending, you know, that you just work harder and try harder and God will love you more. No, okay. Um, but nonetheless, it does, we can agree with Aristotle that, like I said before, you don't develop patience without being put in situations that cause you to become patient and then deciding, I'm going to be patient. You can decide not to be patient. And you can start yelling at people. Or you can decide to be patient. Occasionally, this is very stupid sounding, but it's very small. I, I don't like it, but my husband makes the car too hot. You know, Because when we go places, See, he takes his coat off when we take on trip. Like it's winter. You're wearing a coat. No, I put the coat in the back seat because we're in the car now. It's like, when are you going to get out of the car? And then you got to. Anyway, so it's always hot because I'm in a coat and he's not. And sometimes, not very often, okay, sometimes it's like, there's a lot in here. I'm going to die. And then sometimes I think, oh, I am, I recognize it. I am quite uncomfortable. And I'm just going to breathe slowly and practice being uncomfortable. Because maybe sometime I will need to be uncomfortable in the future, which is probably going to happen. And when I do, I will have practice, you see, at keeping calm and not, why is it so hot in here? Just, yeah. And so anything we do, so uh, the, the, I have quite a few students who are Catholic. And they have a, a, a habit, it's offering it up. Like, I've got a hangnail, a, you know, paper cutter, whatever, offer it up, they say. In other words, like, you're, you're feeling pain, offer it up to God. It's, it's small pain, but like, this is your opportunity to withstand pain, offer it up. That's what they'll tell their kids, offer it up. Because you can choose, right? I'm just gonna, ooh, it's hurt so bad. You can just say, Lord, you know I'm in pain. You were in a lot more pain than this for me. I offer this pain to you such as it is. Use it to make me more patient. Use it to make me more kind. Use it to make me a little more loving, whatever. Okay, I'm sorry. When did I start preaching? When did we leave Aristotle and I started preaching? So we have to look at what virtue is. And he says, um, on the top of page 32, the virtues, pre previous to this, he said that... Um, you know, we, we are potentially something, and then we are actually something. Um, in, in, in many cases, uh, through training, like the intellectual virtues. But he says, but the virtues we do acquire by first exercising them. You don't learn about them first and then do it. You actually do it to learn it. Anything we have to learn to do, we learn Anything that we have to learn to do, we learn by the actual doing of it. People become builders by building, and instrumentalists by playing instruments. Similarly, we become just by performing just acts, temperate by performing temperate ones, brave by performing brave ones. And then skipping down, uh, right, line 14, down below. It is the way we behave in our dealings with other people that makes us just or unjust, and the way that we behave in the face of danger, accustoming ourselves to be timid or confident, that makes us brave or cowardly. Similarly with situations involving desires and angry feelings. Some people become temperate and patient from one kind of conduct in such situations. Others, licentious and choleric from another. In a word, then, like activities produce like dispositions. Hence, we must give our activities a certain quality, because it is their characteristics that determine the resulting dispositions. 
So it matters of, it is a matter of no little importance what sort of habits we form from the earliest age. It makes a vast difference, or rather, all the difference in the world. This is the circle, right? We, we do it, we, we do it, okay, we're brave. And we feed a disposition to be brave. And then we, as we're developing the disposition, it makes it easier to be brave. So I'm brave once, it's like, I was brave. And I'm developing the disposition, it makes them, I, I can do that again. And it feeds. I do it to become that sort of person, and I am that sort of person because I do it. And it goes around and around. But you know, you can get on the opposite circle too. I'm an angry jerk. That is not one of his categories, by the way. And I feed the angry jerk disposition in my soul. And then it's easier to be an angry jerk. And I, it's also easier to be an angry jerk when you're surrounded by angry jerks, you know? I wonder if that's the road rage, I don't, I don't know what that is, you know, mentality, but we, we're just surrounded by that sort of thing. No, this, this is true, but, but we have to guard ourselves from that, right? And, and remember that their disposition does not have to, and I think that Aristotle might argue that the disposition of the other person is not, does not necessarily affect yours unless you allow it to. That we are the gatekeepers. Um, oh, now we're Socrates again and Plato. You know, this needs to be the ruler, right? I am not going to let this person suck me into that. But, I mean, it's easy for me to say that sitting here in this nice cozy room, and then when it's happening, it's not easy for me any more than it is for you. I don't want to get the impression that it is, but, but yet I still consent. Whenever I decide to snap at someone, I've consented to be that sort of person. And that's the old, you know, count to 10 when you're angry these sort of delaying tactics before you just snap to give the gate, you know, the gatekeeper time to run in and say, don't do it, don't do it. Don't hit send on that email. You don't want to do that. Um, top of page 33. Love this statement. Since the branch of philosophy on which we are at present engaged is not like the others theoretical in its aim. Aristotle says, I, I'm not just studying a theory here. I want to know how to do it. Because we are studying not to know what goodness is, but how to become good men, since otherwise it would be useless. I can study what the good is or the just till I'm older than Socrates. And if it doesn't make me a better person, it's done nothing. I guess you know what we could substitute there? This is scarier. We can study theology in the Bible until we're older than Methuselah. And if it doesn't change the sort of person we are, there's something. Something wrong. That is scary. Methuselah was very old. Okay. Um, so. Um, uh, the circle one? Yeah, I, we kind of did. Let's go back to that line and see exactly what I was looking for. 1104A35. Oh, okay. So at the bottom of page 34, it is by refraining from pleasures that we become temperate. And it is when we have become temperate that we are most able to abstain from pleasures. So, when I am temperate, not eating or drinking to excess, you know, I'm temperate in it. I, I, okay, I did a temperate act. I only ate one of those cookies, all right? And now, 
I have helped form a temperate disposition, and it is from a temperate disposition that I perform the next temperate act. So let me read that again. It is by refraining from pleasures that we become temperate, and it is when we have become temperate that we are most able to refrain from pleasures. Does, it, does that kind of make sense? Until, until, just like a car going around and around in a circle, and it's run a groove in the, in the dirt or the pavement, we've run a groove, and this is what we call a habit. So that I have developed the habit of looking at the cookies in a certain way and saying, I don't need to eat 12 of them. And I don't, you know, I don't even need to say that anymore. It is now my habit to just take one or two because that's what a normal person does. And it tastes good and then I move on because now I've got the habit. You see, but as you're forming the groove, you know, it's, it's hard. And each time you've got to make the decision. What? I know, see, that's because I don't have the habit. Um, but anything we do by habit, you know this, you have habits. You probably don't. If, if, if you do, I don't judge you. But you probably don't every night make a, a decision. You don't ask yourself, shall I brush my teeth? And you don't have a long deliberation about the pros and cons of brushing your teeth every night. Probably. Because your mom stood over you when you were little, like, brush your teeth, it's time to brush your teeth. You know, and you've done it so many times that I would guess that if you are in a situation and you go to bed without brushing your teeth, something feels off. You see, you have the habit, and you don't really have to think about it anymore. In fact, if you act opposed to it, you don't feel right. And, and we can do this with virtue. Habit is our friend, and that doesn't make it less spiritually valuable or less a product of grace either. The fact that God gives us this wonderful thing called habit, that we can place ourselves in, in the tracks on the groove, and it, and it doesn't mean we haven't been virtuous just because it's our habit. We have been, because how did you get the habit? By doing it over and over, or a negative habit. Unfortunately, same, same as the case. So is that, that we good? Um, so I asked you, let's go to this next question. So we only have 15 minutes here. Um, Okay, let's look at page 37. I think this is, is very interesting. Um, go down to line uh, 28. It starts with but. Yeah, Carson, go ahead. Oh, we go till 55? We go till 5 till? Why have I thought that we were supposed to quit at a quarter till? Why have I felt? Because I've been I've been feeling guilty for a whole year, and now I'm told that I. Oh. I'm I'm having happiness. Okay. All right. Awesome. Okay. Oh, great. Well, I shouldn't have skipped some of this stuff then. Okay. Uh, but we are going to talk about this. Anyway, uh, uh, so back to page 37. But virtuous acts are not done in a just or temperate way merely because they have a certain quality, but only if the agent also acts in a certain state. That is, one, if he knows what he's doing, Two, if he chooses it and chooses it for its own sake. And three, if he does it from a fixed and permanent disposition. So, if I take two cookies and then you come and you just take all the rest of them, I can't say, I only ate two cookies. But no, because somebody took the rest of the cookies. You didn't make a choice. The cookies were gone. 
You can't go back to the buffet and then pride yourself on your temperance when the thing you wanted is gone. That was not your conscious choice, all right? Likewise, if I am accidentally virtuous, I don't know how that would happen. Like, I tried to grab as many M&Ms as I could, but, but you know how you, grab, you can't get your hand back out of the jar? You know this. Please tell me you know this. So you have to let some of them go, and then I can't say, look how few I... No, I, I was inadvertently virtuous and temperate. I didn't choose to do it. I can't accidentally do it. And the third thing he says is I have to do it from a fixed disposition. So the first few times, I, like, I can't say I am, I am a courageous person. I was brave twice. Well, good for you. You're on the way to forming a disposition. But I am not going to judge. Someone else, or Aristotle, is not going to come judge me and say, you are a brave person. Like, yeah, I was brave twice. Like, well, work on that. It's never an accident. You wanted to say something, Matthew? Oh, no. Um, so to elaborate on that, Aristotle says, next, next page, page 38. Um, starting with the first complete sentence, the beginning of the sentence that starts acts. <clears throat> acts, to be sure, are called just and temperate when they are such as a just or temperate man would do. But what makes the agent just or temperate is not merely the fact that he does such things, but the fact that he does them in the way that just and temperate men do. It is therefore right to say that a man becomes just by the performance of just and temperate by the performance of temperate acts. Nor is there the smallest likelihood of any man's becoming good by not doing them. This is not, however, the course that most people follow. They have recourse to their principle and imagine that they are being philosophical and that in this way they will become serious-minded, behaving rather like in invalids who listen carefully to the doctor but carry out none of his instructions. Just as the bodies of the latter will get no benefit from such treatment, so the souls of the former will get none from such philosophy. We cannot just sit and brood on what justice, temperance, and courage are. We've got to get up off our duffs and do it. And that's the only way to get it. It's like reading books on health and exercise while you sit on the couch and eat potato chips. Or, my personal favorite, watching an exercise video while you lay on the couch. It does not make you healthy. <laughs> um, it, it just it just doesn't. Um, so he goes on to talk in the next couple of sections. He talks about um, the the kinds of uh, he calls them modification. The kinds of uh, things. I don't want to use the word things. The kinds of faculties, the kinds of abilities, the kinds of modes that are set up in your soul. He says we have feelings, we have faculties and we have dispositions. Feelings are feelings. I'm angry, I'm disappointed, and nobody really praises you or blames you for feelings. It's what you do because you feel them that people praise, praise or blame you for. Nobody says you're, you're wicked because you feel anger. You're wicked if you smack them after you feel anger. You know what I mean? But nobody, you, you're disappointed. Nobody says you're just a wicked person. You're disappointed. No. And his faculty is just the ability, the capability of feeling those things. No one praises you because you have the capability of feeling angry or the capability of being disappointed. Yes, that would be a little weird. And that wouldn't be virtuous either, would it? I'm, if you're incapable of becoming angry, then there's no virtue in not ever being angry. Yes. 
So I wonder if our feelings are a blessing from God because they are the raw material that we can use to be molded into the people that we need to be. I'm thinking, because I'm thinking, when you said had no capacity to, to feel something. You know, there are people, maybe I mentioned this in this class, there are people who don't feel any pain. Like you can have a nerve condition where you feel no pain. And it's horrible. Because it sounds good. It's like, yeah, sign me up. You know what? They could, they could practically cut their hand right off and they wouldn't know it. And they could bleed to death. You could stick your hand in a fire and not feel it. And you know, the pain says, take your hand out of the fire for crying out loud. Don't do that. That's what pain says. Don't do it. Get attention for this. This is not good. And if you had no capacity, like that endangers your life. And I wonder if our capacity for feeling, if we had no capacity for feeling, it would endanger our spiritual life because then we'd have no, we just think, we naturally would think we have all the virtues, but we actually just have no capacity to feel the things that would heal us the things that ail us, the sin that ails us. Am I, am I now babbling? Have I turned into Aristotle? Or worse, have I turned into Socrates? Um, so he decides it's, it's, it's a disposition. But of course, in Aristotelian logic and thinking, when we do a definition of something, we decide what genus it belongs to, and then how is it different from all the rest, right? So a, a recliner is a chair, that's its genus, which has a little lever by the side and you can put your feet up and lean back. That's a recliner, unlike this chair or that chair. So that's, it's in this group, but it's different from the rest of the members of this group in this way. So he says, okay, it's a disposition, um, that virtue is a disposition. How is it different? He said, well, to, to answer this question, we're gonna try to figure out what human virtue is. What is the virtue of anything? And then we'll see what human virtue is. How is it different from all other dispositions? Well, what is the virtue of an eye to be able to see? What is the virtue of an ear to be able to hear? So he says on the top of page 40, then human excellence will be the disposition that makes one a good man and causes him to perform his function well. We have already explained how this will be. In other words, what is our function? We are political. We are social. We're going to live in a group with other people and we're going to react to them in such a way that it is virtuous. Now, we get to the final thing, the doctrine of the mean. Anybody want to tell me what you wrote down for what is the doctrine of the mean? Oh. Yeah, Matthew, go for it. Yes. You'll do anything to get a laugh, yeah. yes. And the one that you're absolutely crude, I forgot the exact He calls them a boar. Boar. Boar, B-O-O-R. Not a boar, but a boar. <laughs> Same difference. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Sometimes this is referred to as the golden mean. Finding the in-between state, in between what Aristotle would say, excess and deficiency. Yes, Ethan. Um, did I say excess and deficiency? Yes. <laughs> Yes. 
Yes. And this is, now, so Aristotle's mean, Aristotle's average is different from a mathematical average, and here's why. Bottom of page 40. Oh, do it. Do it, Ethan. Read whatever you want. I stole your answer. <laughs> I like that one too. Yeah, Milo, he's a famous wrestler. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, exactly. That's exactly what I was going to read. So, so, in other words, there is a time when it is appropriate to become more angry or less angry. Now, let's just look at the life of Jesus because I always feel pretty secure looking at the life of Jesus because he's sinless. You know what I mean? If he did it, it's okay. And... <clears throat> He got very angry with the money changers in the temple. As we go into Holy Week here, uh, or, no, we don't get into it, we're in it. Um, uh, he, that was appropriate anger directed at the appropriate people because they were um, commercializing and making a profit off people's uh, sacrifices, the people who were buying animals for sacrifice or, or exchanging money. He got very angry with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he called them some not very pleasant names. But, but for a point, he did not become angry with Martha because she complained that Mary wasn't doing any work. He gently admonished, maybe, okay? Mary's chosen the better, and I'm not taking it away from her. Apparently, there is a level of anger that is appropriate in one situation and is not appropriate in another, towards, the same, towards a certain person in, this, in the right way. And remember, earlier we read that Aristotle said, a person is only virtuous if you did it in the right way, at the right time, for the right person, all these rights. Um, so on the page opposite that, on page 41, it says, by the 20, it's on the line 21. But to have these feelings at the right times, on the right grounds, towards the right people, for the right motive, in the right way, is to feel them to an intermediate that is to the best degree. And this is the mark of virtue. And then down at the very bottom, almost to the end of the page, um, that was what Ethan was reading before, um, that, that it's, it's failure is possible in many ways, but success in only one. It's easy to miss the target and difficult to hit it. This is why virtue is difficult, because we aren't always the best judges of how we should feel and how we should react. And the way I should react, you know, as an older person, as uh, a person of teaching authority in this room. It's different from the way you will react to, to something. So th that's difficult, and that takes wisdom. I, I would say that takes wisdom, and wisdom comes from practice, from the many, many times I have wondered, and my reaction has, has either been excessive or deficient. You know? And then in reflection, you look back and you, you think, oh, shoot, I did not handle that well. This is, this is how I should do that next time. And that's where the experience comes in. So, so then he goes on to give us examples, like Matthew was doing, of, of um, various uh, uh, virtues and their excess and their deficiency. Um, I want to stop just a minute, though, and mention um, 
Thomas Aquinas. So some of, no, none of you have done my medieval year. Because this is only my second year here. Is that right? I only met you guys last year? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so my medieval year, we read some of the Summa of Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica. And, um, and uh, you may know, Thomas Aquinas uh, was a, a Dominican monk, a brilliant man, who used many of the ideas of Aristotle and tried to assess them through the, through the light of the church. And so, so we have revelation, we know this about God, but what from Aristotle is redeemable and what from Aristotle actually gives us insight, psychological insight into ourselves. And um, so he went back to the church fathers, the, the Bible, um, Aristotle, and he produced this monumental work. But he says the same thing, same thing as Aristotle. This is one place where Aquinas was on board. He said, it, if either a good action or a bad action has to come from knowledge and consent. So if someone grabs my hand and they smack Hannah with my hand, I am, I am not a responsible agent. I have not smacked her. I, I'm not a violent person. The person who grabbed my hand is, okay? So if you sin under compulsion, in other words, according to Aquinas, it's not really sin if you were, you were forced to do it, all right? And even, he would go so far as any compulsion. You know, your family's been kidnapped and they say, if you don't do this, if you don't rob that bank, we're gonna murder your family, you know, something like that. You know. He was weighing these cases. But, um, but it's interesting that this is something Aquinas picked up on, that we have to do the right things in the right way with the right intention. You aren't accidentally virtuous, and he would argue, you don't accidentally sin. If you sin in ignorance, you didn't know it was wrong. Pretty much every Christian tradition says, just tell God you're sorry and it's not. He knows, you didn't know, you didn't know it was wrong. It's still sin. I'm not being relativistic here. But there's a difference between saying, I know darn well God forbids that and I'm doing it anyway, so there. Or doing it and you're young or you're, you're ignorant or whatever and you just don't actually know it's wrong. And then when you find out it's wrong, you say, oh, God forgive me, I'm not doing that anymore. These are two separate cases. They both need God's grace and forgiveness, don't get me wrong. But obviously, the, the, the level, what it's doing to you, the circle that it's forming in your soul is not the same in those two cases, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of the dirt poor. That's kind of when the, as far as animal offerings go, the yeah, pigeons and quails is pretty so much the bottom of the. Yes. Yes, a much larger, yes, offering. Well, that's, th thank you. That's a very good point. So, so it, it, this always this section always makes me think of Aquinas, you know, because that idea that it, it's it's something we choose that we don't we're not ex we're not accidentally virtuous people, and we're not in general accidentally sinful people. I hope I'm saying that in the right way and that you understand what I mean. We are sinful people. Like we're born that way. Like I, I get sin. Like it's infected everything. I'm totally with that. But yet there are uh, situations where there's just ignorance. And so it's why many, many traditions, there's just prayer, you know, God forgive my sins, you know, of, of knowledge and of ignorance. One of the orthodox prayers that they say every every Sunday at the liturgy, you know, of knowledge and of ignorance. If I have sinned in ignorance, forgive me for that too. Because I probably have. Yeah, Kyle, what did you want to say? Well, 
I, yeah. Yes. This also has to do with your personal faith tradition, in which in some in some faith traditions there's just like an across the board, it's just sin, it's all sin. And then in some faith traditions there's um, it's all sin, but there are uh, like sins for which we are uh, more culpable or more um, well, it, that, that harm us more than other sins. Because that's ultimately what we do when we sin, right? We say, I am removing myself from the source of all life and love and light, which is never a good thing. And maybe I've distanced myself a little and maybe I've distanced myself a lot. And, but, but some faith traditions might accept that differently. So you should you know, follow yours. Um, but okay, so we're at Tintil. I wanna read this though, because I think this is very cool. Um, on page 47, he says, um, uh, well, let me, I'm still deciding, Ethan. Um, oh, and let's go to page 46 and start on line 16 with the word for. For just as the equal is greater compared with the less and less compared with the greater. This is the equal. This is the less and this is the greater. The equal looks greater compared to the less, compared to the less, but the equal looks less compared to the greater. You see, it depends on which side of it I'm on. Oh, it looks like less. No, it's more, but it depends, yes. For, okay, so the mean states in both feelings and actions are excessive. The mean is excessive compared with the deficient. And it is deficient compared with the excessive. A brave man appears rash compared with a coward and cowardly compared with a rash man, right? Here's the, here's the brave man. I'm a coward. Oh, he's so rash. He goes out there and he just does stuff. Oh, he's so rash. But here's the rash man. And now I'm looking at the brave man. What a coward. What a coward. He, didn't, he doesn't just go out there on the battlefield, just willy-nilly. Just scream and grab his weapons and run for it. He actually thinks about it sometimes beforehand. What a coward. But this guy's like, oh, no, no, no. He's so rash. He goes out there. I would never go out there. And you see how it depends which side you're on? That the person who's normal or the person who's really got it right, everyone else thinks they're wrong. If everyone, if, if there's ever anything in which everyone else thinks you're wrong, you could be wrong, but you could be the normal one and everyone else is off. So it all, it depends on our natural inclination, right? If I am naturally excessive or deficient and I look at the person who's at the mean, they're going to look too far the other direction for me. Does that make sense? And, and so Aristotle points that out, and then he says, um, let me find it. Okay, I'll leave you with this, page 48, bottom paragraph number two. There's a number two in front of it. We must notice the errors into which we ourselves are liable to fall because we all have different natural tendencies. We shall find out what ours are from the pleasure and pain they give us. And we must drag ourselves in the contrary direction, for we shall arrive at the mean by pressing well away from our failing, just like somebody straightening a warped piece of wood. So here's the answer, because I've shared my gluttony very freely with you guys, okay? So, for me, temperance, temperance, learning temperance, may be I don't take any of the cookies today. The cookies aren't evil. And I love your lemon cookie. I'm not, this is not a message to you anyway, I bring the cookies. <laughs> no. Um, but I may have to bend myself away from my excessiveness. Do you see? Actively. 
whereas somebody else might not need to. Didn't we talked about in Plato where he said that in that democratic society that people would be angry at you if you put restrictions on yourself? Because like, well, you, you don't have to do that. Well, I do, maybe I do. I don't have a tolerance for it. So I need to stay out of the bakery, right? Because I need to press that I'm warped too far the other direction. Whereas, and he says, there aren't a lot of people who you know, starve themselves. The other, like the, the deficiency, like being anorexic or something like that, isn't as common as, as overdoing it in the case of food and drink. But you know, if you have someone on the other side, you may need to encourage them to eat. You may need to encourage them to go to the party and relax and live a little, you know. Whereas the other person needs to be encouraged the other direction. It's very interesting how we all have a place on the spectrum, and it reminds me of Socrates. Uh, this isn't Socrates, it's actually the oracle at Delphi. Know thyself. Because the first step, right, is what, it, what are my failings? What are my natural tendencies? Where am I excessive or deficient? And then can I, can I train myself to be more right in the middle? But, but I, I also find it really fascinating that, um, that the person who is reasonable, rational, correct in whatever way, that they're here in the middle, all the people around them looking at them from different directions are all going to think they're too far that way. They're all going to think they're too far that way. And so I guess the moral of the story today for us is we should be careful when we judge. We already know that we're supposed to be careful when we judge other people because it is to their own master that they stand or fall, right? We don't know what their inclinations, what their excesses or their deficiencies are and what they might try to be, work, you know, be working out in their own spirits and souls. And so just because people you know, deny themselves something or encourage themselves to indulge in something, we don't know where on this spectrum we're looking at that person and where they are. So let's be careful. Love, love conquers, right? Love conquers all, I don't know if that's true, but love is the answer to most of our problems with each other. Okay, read books three and four, finish your paper if you have not already given me one, and thank you for informing, we have, we have extra time. I'll see you next week. <laughs>